The Susan Brenda Show is a radio show online broadcasted on YouTube across the United States and globally. The show features guests who speak about health, spirituality, entertainment, and a host of subjects to enlighten people across the nation. Listen to the show that empowers women and men alike and highlights those who have made a difference. I'm Susan Brender, and this is The Susan Brender Show, and I would like to tell you about our guest today. His name is Ralph Sanchez, and he is the author of The Diabetic Brain in Alzheimer's Disease, a book that connects the dots between type 2 diabetes, type 3 diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease. Ralph has spent nearly two decades intensively researching the risk factors of Alzheimer's, and his passion is sharing his insights on the AD pandemic and how it can possibly apply to your own risk for cognitive decline as you age. I'm proud to say that we just finished a great series with Ralph that he will debut in the upcoming months, hopefully. Welcome, Ralph. I understand you have some fascinating research on similarities of Alzheimer's and COVID-19. Please share what you know with our guest. Uh, Thank you, Susan. It's uh, such a pleasure to be back on with you. And um, yes, you know, when I began my my work in the field of health and wellness and started out as an acupuncturist, I actually uh, did a lot of volunteer work in the AIDS community. So I became very, very comfortable and familiar with working with immune disorders. And of course, in AIDS, uh, that's a huge issue. And what I saw consistently in people that were uh, dealing with the crisis, and indeed it was a crisis at the time, uh, there's so many similarities between when AIDS first surfaced and what's going on now, you know, with the fear and the transmission issues and whatnot. Uh, People were even just afraid to be around gay people. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, So I... um, I just, it was part of my calling to work uh, and serve that community. And I thought it was actually going to be um, a much longer involvement, but things changed, you know, life changes. Nevertheless, you know, the work with Chinese medicine and herbs and immunity really, really strengthened my foundation in terms of my work in health and wellness. And it was something that I really loved. You know, our immune systems obviously are, are critical components to our health. And like everything else, it declines in aging. Our immune systems get weaker. And lo and behold, we're seeing a prime example of that right now, aren't we? You know, who is it that's more susceptible, more vulnerable to a COVID-19? And I just want to differentiate a couple of things because I know the terms are sometimes mixed up. The virus is SARS-CoV-2. The disease process is COVID-19, which is characterized by fever, cough, shortness of breath, you know, flu-like symptoms, diarrhea too. But nevertheless, you know, the whole idea that, uh, you know, this is affecting a population of people that are not only older, but also have some issues with their health that predisposes them to more a severe complication issue related to the infection of the coronavirus. And people by now hearing this have heard that obesity, um, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease, those are huge, huge risk factors for having a more severe issue with this infection. So when I saw that uh, in the very beginning, a couple of things really stood out to me. And one was, well, geez, this is the exact same thing I talk about in terms of addressing to reduce your risk for Alzheimer's disease, obesity, diabetes, right? Hypertension, you know, and cardiovascular disease. That's the gist of my book, The Diabetic Brain and Alzheimer's Disease, and how important it is to address these factors earlier rather than later. So what a perfect time it is for many people that are 
you know, on a bit of a lockdown basis and um, concerned about their future and even their immediate future with this uh, virus issue, why not focus on getting healthier and perhaps protecting yourself more so, not only against the virus, but against more severe issues later in life, like Alzheimer's disease. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? You know, it does. um, And not only does it do that, it kind of leads me to asking you, who is more susceptible uh, to the virus? Well, it's like I just said, Susan, people that have uh, health complications. So people that have obesity, people, I'll never forget when I was watching uh, some of the news reports on this uh, some time ago, and a family, a family had been stricken. Uh, quite a few members of the family had uh, passed away. And they showed a snapshot of the family, you know, and every single person in that family was severely overweight and uh, they had lost several members, uh, quite a few. So obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. And the reason it works on those is fascinating. So I got really busy and started to look at it because One of the things in the very, very beginning, I'll never forget when I heard this, it really alarmed me because of um, my own personal history. Yes, so one of the things that uh, inspired me, of course, was my own personal history. And just as I had realized I had a personal history that might increase my risk for dementia as I aged, you know, as I started seeing issues related to what increases the risk for the coronavirus, I thought, well, you know, I'm at a higher risk too. Because one of the issues that surfaced for me many years ago was hypertension related to a urinary tract blockage. So I'm on an antihypertensive medication. And I'll never forget when Dr. Fauci was on talking in a... um, more restricted um, interview. This was not on television. He wouldn't um, say this on television. This was in the very beginning. It was an interview with um, uh, one of the directors of the Journal of the American Medical Association. And he said he was having conversations around the world with uh, several doctors. And uh, what had surfaced was a very interesting component to who was dying. Uh, after the complications of the coronavirus, and it was largely people with hypertension and cardiovascular disease. And that was uh, really something that perked up my interest. And he didn't know why at the time. Since then, and it's only been a couple of months, but since then, all kinds of studies have surfaced looking at this. But one of the things that he mentioned was, and he was guessing, was that Why would it be that hypertension, especially hypertension that was controlled by antihypertensives, and he was assuming that, but that hypertension was the majority of cases that were, um, you know, winding up as uh, cases that eventually uh, died. And uh, so there was a huge connection there that they were seeing early on. And so I got busy and started looking at it. And this thing is fascinating the relationship between cardiovascular disease and hypertension and diabetes and obesity, because they all have similar components in terms of the risk and how it affects your blood pressure and a receptor for, um, for an antihypertensive medication that the coronavirus also uses to gain access into the cell. And that receptor is called ACE2, A-C-E-2. And that receptor is a very, very important receptor in terms of controlling hypertension. It's also very rich besides in the lung and other tissues in the body like the heart and kidney. So it's a very, very important receptor in terms of this whole cascade of events that happens with hypertension. And that is called the renin-angiotensin 
system. And that system utilizes, in terms of these antihypertensive medications, this ACE2 receptor, which helps to control hypertension. And when um, you are taking a medication that's called an ACE inhibitor or uh, uh, angiotensin receptor blocker, they're called ARBs, so ACE inhibitors or ARBs, it was suspected that because it increases the levels of these ACE2 receptors, which is a good thing, they were saying, well, that's why the coronavirus is seemingly a bigger problem in these people. And so they were wondering, should we take people off of these medications once they get infected? What do we do? Well, since then, it's been uh, looked at very carefully, as I said. And they've come to the conclusion, and it's one bit based on science and a rationale, that while it may increase the vulnerability and the infectivity to the coronavirus, this ACE2 receptor and the antihypertensive medications, it actually winds up being protective during the disease process as it progresses. So that's a fascinating correlation and one that everybody should be aware of. Ralph, let me ask you a question. You you actually answered it before, but I, I'd like to understand a little bit more of inflammation angle to this disease. Um, people, I mean, when you talk about inflammation, tell our audience exactly what you mean and why that has a, a particular, particularly high, uh, becomes a high risk factor. Uh, great question. Um, and what we've seen here is that inflammation, and this is the way even some studies um, quote it, but they say, and the progression, when it gets to a more severe complication, COVID-19, the inflammation angle to it goes berserk. In other words, a lot of inflammation is a component to the um, complications associated with COVID-19. And here is why. I just did a, a webinar on this where I focused on nutrition and how focusing on nutrition and diet is really important. Obviously, everybody knows this, and to some extent, that uh, good, a good healthy diet is anti-inflammatory. But the overlapping characteristics of why and how uh, COVID-19 can progress into more a severe complication related to inflammation is very, very fascinating. And past shows that we've done, Susan, we've talked about this. There is what's called a master regulator of inflammation. It's called NF-kappa-B. And the abbreviation for it is nf F as in Frank, dash, kappa, K, and then B as in boy, NFKB. And NFKB is a master regulator of inflammation. And all disease processes, especially things like diabetes, obesity, hypertension, uh, once those diseases progress, then this regulator of inflammation gets triggered and it, what it does is it triggers a lot of genetic expression related to, to inflammation, uh, a similar pattern that we've talked about, which is oxidative stress. Actually, I, I think it's more important to talk about the difference between the regular flu and, and this pandemic, because when people found out that so many people were dying of the flu, um, they concentrated on what could be done to help that, and they came up with a vaccine, okay? Now, what, in your opinion, and I'm going off on a tangent right now, in your opinion, why is it taking so long to come up with a, a, a shot, if you will, uh, or some kind of medicine that will actually stop this? Well, because it takes time to develop something like that. You know, you just don't come up with it overnight. You have to go through trials. Vaccines are, you know, a very difficult proposition. There's a lot of problems with vaccine development. And um, it takes time to weed through all of the problems. 
So that's months and months. And why they're saying it's going to take at least a year, probably, if we're lucky, to get something in development. In the meantime, there are other things that are being looked at that are are very, very similar, which is the transfusion of plasma blood uh, from uh, people that have been infected and are showing antibodies and uh, transferring that into uh, people at risk uh, that, um, you know, can possibly upregulate this antibody reaction and some sort of immunity. But that's um, something that's just, in experimentation, if you will, right now. Um, They're probably going to start using that approach um, very, very soon because uh, they've already seen some benefits. But as as far as any medication, well, you know, they're experimenting with things right now, like, you know, uh, hydroxychloroquine was something, but a study just came out, a study that just came out showed that hydroxychloroquine was not that effective and there are actually some pretty severe complications that can happen with it, although there have been some anecdotal reports of people that got better with it. But overall, there doesn't really seem to be much hope there for it, Um, especially that combination of hydroxychloroquine and and, um, an antibiotic that they were using with it. Um, So what you're saying is that nutrition and lifestyle is the beginning and perhaps one of the most important ways to curb what we're seeing right now. Is that correct? Uh, Well, yes. And let me just point out in the webinar I did, I did an extensive overview on supplements. Um, And supplements, when they get into the category of um, higher dosing and more appropriate uh, supplementation for something like building your immune system, they're called nutraceuticals. And I I went through the research, and so the research is actually very active right now and has been for some time, but it's very active in how this could apply to the coronavirus, and I want to make a caveat here that none of this information that we're talking about is intended to be um, interpreted as medical advice. I'm just regurgitating with the information out there uh, in terms of the science. So my webinar was a very science-based presentation. That's what I promoted it as, and that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the science. And so the science shows very clearly uh, they're surfacing um, or things are surfacing around vitamin D and the prevention. And, you know, vitamin D has been uh, utilized for uh, preventing colds and flus for, for quite some time in the more progressive medical community. And we know that vitamin D is very, very important for immunity. So taking higher dosages uh, appropriate to your need for it, you should be tested, is extremely important. And um, same with zinc. Most people are deficient in in zinc. So you should be upping your zinc levels and you should be tested for for a possible deficiency of zinc. You know, so there's many nutrients like that. A lot of people don't even understand that a simple B vitamin complex is actually very, very important uh, to your immune system as well, too. Uh, When I did my work with the AIDS community, the people that by and large survived and did much better are the ones that straightened out their lifestyle and their diet. Those are the ones that did much better and the ones that supplemented. Once supplements uh, really supported their health, antioxidants, You know, things like glutathione, which is extremely important when you're fighting an infection or when your immunity is down. It's uh, an antioxidant that the body uses to fight off issues related to stress and infections. And an, an important component to glutathione is selenium, a trace mineral. And selenium and glutathione combine to produce something called glutathione peroxidase. And many studies back then have started to surface around um, people with AIDS and having selenium deficiency and being a more prone to um, bigger problems associated with the AIDS virus. I'll never forget when Oprah jumped on the bandwagon and she was, um, you know, promoting uh, things that might help the AIDS community. And I tried to write to her and I said, look, You know, you're talking about this and that, but you're not talking about nutrition. You know, she wanted to get these uh, drugs, which were important, drugs over into um, 
uh, communities and places around the world that really needed this uh, support. And the antivirals at the time were seemingly uh, working to some extent. And they're a huge component to the answer right now. And of course, they're looking at antivirals very carefully. And um, there's been some great anecdotal evidence with some antivirals and improvement with the uh, COVID-19 disease process. But antivirals are an important component to all of this. And um, what supports that antiviral activity? Well, nutrition and antioxidants and anti-inflammatory substances, you know, so that's why glutathione and selenium are very, very important. And your diet is very, very important. So we talked about, you know, our diets and what counters the NF-kappa-B, NF-KB, which is the master regular of inflammation. Well, what's the counter to that? It's NRF2 which, you know, boosts up our anti-inflammatory antioxidant systems in the body. And both NRF2 and NF-kappa-B, what they do is they trigger gene responses, genetic expression that really is either very protective or very damaging. So that's why you want to focus on these nutrients because a lot of these nutrients are particularly effective in terms of dealing and supporting your immunity through triggering NRF2 and anti-inflammation, antioxidant responses. One of the biggest ones that I've talked about in the webinar that I'm a huge fan of is sulforaphane, which comes in cruciferous vegetables. And so getting a lot of cruciferous vegetables, particularly the broccoli family, but you know, there is a broccoli sprouts. That's where this uh, information around sulforaphane first surfaced because it has very, very high concentrations. And um, other foods like cabbages and Brussels sprouts and broccoli, although they have a good amount, a lot of it is destroyed in cooking. Um, so broccoli sprouts are a great way to do it. Uh, get that extra sulforaphane or what you can do. And this is what I've advised people to do when they're cooking with... Um, you know, broccoli and other cruciferous vegetables is that you chop it up because when you chop it up, you're releasing an enzyme that actually produces a sulforaphane from a precursor. Um, and the sulforaphane is released uh, in an action that involves an enzyme called morosinase. So if you chop up your broccoli a little bit before you cook it, at least uh, let it sit for 15, 20 minutes, and then don't cook it to death, steam it, uh, then you're going to get more sulforaphane out of it. And you can get sulforaphane supplements. I take a sulforaphane supplement two or three times a week to make sure I'm upregulating those pathways as much as possible. So a lot of these things related to supplements and nutrition are key factors. And the overlapping stuff that I talked about in the beginning in terms of not only building your immunity, but also addressing issues related to obesity, inflammation, I mean, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. You're getting the benefit across the board in all of these potential problems that not only are increasing your risk for um, more severe complications related to the virus, but to possible issues related to Alzheimer's later in life. So what a better time to get started than now. And what did I stress over and over in some podcasts that we did, especially that series, that midlife, if you're middle-aged and you are dealing with health issues, uh, now's a good time to get busy and start getting your health in order. Um, you're going to do much better if you're infected with the coronavirus because we know that it's not only about now. This coronavirus is here to stay, folks. It's not going anywhere, okay? So we're going to hopefully address it now in terms of uh, being able to deal with it more effectively. But even if we get to the point where uh, it seems to be at a lower rate in terms of the numbers around the country and the world, it's very likely to surface back again if we relax too much and become another pandemic again. So we have to be very, very careful. And there's some things around what we're doing now that we probably should be uh, observing uh, more carefully throughout our life now, which is, you know, just how 
how close we are to people, make sure we're not out there if we're sick, you know, and uh, protecting ourselves a little bit more in one way or another. Ralph, this is a great time to, uh, to stop the show, if you will. Um, how do people get in touch with you? Because you, I, I call you my genius. I call you the man who really has ideas and a lot of science backing whatever you say. So I'd like people to really know that Ralph Sanchez is available to them. How did they get to, uh, to talk to you, read your books, and in fact, talk a little bit about your books because we really need to learn a little bit more about all these diseases? Oh, thank you so much, Susan. So as before, the Alzheimer's Solution Dot com And don't confuse that with a book that's actually called The Alzheimer's Solution. That's not me. So if you just put in The Alzheimer's Solution, you may see that book. But the TheAlzheimer'sSolution.com will get you to me where you can access me. And you'll see my book at the TheAlzheimer'sSolution.com, The Diabetic Brain and Alzheimer's Disease. And that'll take you over to Amazon. And that's where the book is. Uh, but uh, what I'm offering people at the Alzheimer's Solution right now, if they opt into a free membership, is they, they'll get a nice um, PDF of all the supplements that I highly recommend. So you'll be able to get that as an immediate download, you know, when you opt in for a free membership. And that lists all the supplements that I Highly, highly recommend, and eventually I'm going to be uh, including diet into that uh, PDF as well, too. The diet factors that we talked about, the um, polyphenols, you know, and related compounds like sulforaphane, but we didn't talk enough about uh, polyphenols like we have with Alzheimer's. Uh, polyphenols are like, um, you know, related compounds that are found in uh, berries, you know, and other fruits and vegetables, leafy greens, you know, they're, they're, they're fantastic foods. And, you know, what I'm offering right now as well is a a COVID-19 healthy diet uh, 30 day plan, which includes a meditation course. And if they uh, contact me at the alzheimersolution.com, there's a contact link right there and uh, you can just email me and say how do i get my covid19 healthy diet uh, plan that is free so they can get that for free i'm offering that for free they can also um, find that over at my facebook page the alzheimer's solution facebook page so there's lots of things there that i'm offering people to support getting healthier okay um, and that's at thealzheimersolution.com, and you can contact me there. Thank you very much, Ralph Sanchez, the author of The Diabetic Brain and Alzheimer's Disease, a book that connects the dots. And I'm not going to tell you again what the dots are, but Ralph can. So anybody who's listening to the show, I want you to get on to his site and ask him any question that you have. Read his book because it's going to tell you a lot about Alzheimer's disease and the connection with the COVID-19. So thank you again, Ralph, for being on the Susan Brenda Show. It was a pleasure. Thank you again, Susan. We'll be talking soon, I'm sure. 